Okay, so, um, all right, this, although it doesn't say so in the program, is a joint presentation between me and my invisible friend Andrew Bourbon here. Um, Andrew couldn't make it today, but he's sent two videos um, which I'll be playing as part of this. So uh, it's going to be a proper multimedia extravaganza. Um, so, what does the um, alliteration, the heavy title uh, refer to? So, um, mixed messages. Basically, the idea of the mixing is a way of uh, um, in the words of Eric Clark, creating a, a subject position for your audience so that you are encouraged to interpret a series of um, musical elements in a particular way. And um, what we're, um, uh, Andrew and I are going to look at today is um, starting with uh, the idea of sonic cartoons, which I've written about an awful lot now, I should stop. Um, uh, sonic cartoons, the idea of, of um, recorded music as representational systems, or as a representational system, um, that has a dual aspect, and one of those aspects is the thing that is being represented, the performances that happened in the studio that have been edited together in various ways and processed in various ways. And um, and the other is, I suppose, what you call the audibility of the system. The fact that uh, um, the fact that I can hear the processing, I can hear something about the processing in the recorded music, and that that. Um, in the same way that uh, the um, uh, the special effects in a movie, the use of close-ups, those kinds of things become part of my appreciation of the music of the movie as well as the acting. Um, it, it kind of separates me from the actual narrative of the art object, if you like, but it creates a holistic art object which is made up of both of those things, the story that is being represented and the representational system that I can appreciate as um, clever artistic manipulation. So that um, is a kind of, I suppose that's the idea of Sonic cartoons, but the other thing about Sonic cartoons is the idea of what's not represented. That it's a representational system that isn't the thing. That um, if I'm listening to recorded music, obviously the most obvious thing that is not represented in um, stereo audio is the visual activity that made those sounds. Uh, but there are a lot of other things that aren't represented or that are distorted in the representation to, uh, to be different than um, uh, they may have been in the original performance or, or that are actually constructed rather than distorted in a particular way. Uh, that's not quite as succinct and elegant as I'd like to put it, but that'll do. So, um, the idea of the ecological approach to perception and embodied cognition keeps coming up at these conferences, quite a lot of it with me. Um, and the, the two features that uh, are important for this discussion today the idea of invariant properties and affordances. So the invariant properties are um, a particular feature that it affords either a type of activity or a type of interpretation. So, um, if I hear a high-pitched sound, there are certain high-pitched sounds, well, generally, 
I associate high pitch sound with small objects and low pitch sound with large objects. That's um, because of the sort of physics of the world, kind of worked pretty well with animals, um, and uh, it works fairly well with physical objects that are inanimate as well. Um, and there are, um, there are lots of invariant properties that produce affordances for interpretation that are ingrained in our um, cognitive systems. And size and pitch is one such pair of them. And that uh, brings us on to another um, kind of way that these things produce, well, Alan Moore would disapprove of the use of meaning rather than potential interpretations, but it's sort of a shorthand. Um, similes and metaphors that, uh, when I hear a shouting voice, I hear an angry person. I don't hear a dis, well, I did hear a disembodied voice, but I don't hear, um, I, the way I understand the shouting voice is because of my knowledge of angry people. That's more of a simile, whereas something like the connection between size and energy levels and levels of power is more of a metaphorical connection. There's no kind of immediate direct connection as there might be between the physical properties of a, a mouse squeaking and the size of the animal. Uh, I'm talking about more of, uh, of a metaphorical connection. And those will hopefully become clearer as um, and Andrew plays you lots of bass drums and snare drums. And the last thing I wanted to mention in this sort of introductory slide is the, the idea of this working on different levels. Of, uh, from, uh, from the mixed perspective, we are uh, looking at ways of processing that change the potential uh, metaphorical meaning or potential interpretation right from um, how big a bass drum is in the mix, so at the kind of micro level, through um, phrasing, how connected a series of sounds are together in um, in the audio stream, through to structural um, levels of how uh, how um, different aspects of the structure flow from one area to another, and through to the whole narrative of a track. So this uh, mixing process <coughs> works at all of those levels, and obviously you're thinking about that the whole time whilst you're uh, creating these, um, these mixed messages. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about this in terms of five perceived features that I think these are the ones that I've just cut and pasted from the abstract. Um, so I'll just go through how essentially the, um, the ecological approach can break down the invariant properties that I'm talking about into these five types of features. We've got, um, well, I'm gonna go, uh, I don't want to get tied up with academic work theory and the uh, idea of human and non-human actors here, although it is related to this, but the idea of agents um, is about activity in this sense. It's about things that are perceived to be active, and from the uh, perception, uh, from the perspective of um, the ecological approach and the idea of metaphorical connections. On the one hand, it might be a, a straightforward empathic connection between, as it, as it very often is, with a voice. That you hear a voice and you understand the meaning in that voice through your own experience of vocalisation. Um, but 
there are, I mean, we can also understand drummers if we're not drummers, or guitarists if we're not guitarists. And um, on the kind of macro level, going away from music, the, uh, this ecological approach would suggest that I understand bulldozers in terms of uh, metaphors with my own bodily experience about pushing things or um, how big they are or how strong they are. Then uh, types of energy being expended, that kind of leads on the idea of, um, of hearing or perceiving um, from a multimodal perspective, pushing, pulling, grasping, um, and and this is where, if we come back to music, what we're doing is hearing a single feature, the sound of an activity, as being a cipher for the activity itself, of um, as being a schematic representation of action and understanding music in those terms. And the same with the idea of the level of energy being expended. Um, and this is going back to the idea of sonic cartoons. Well, with both of these things, uh, we can think of, uh, we, can hit, we can think of schematic representations as uh, in the same way that a line drawing represents quite complicated visual stimulus in a simplified way by removing some of the features and simplifying others, that um, recording often does that to sound. When I um, dynamically compress a, um, a quietly sung vocal, uh, sorry, a loudly sung vocal, um, and stop the actual dynamic change or re reduce the dynamic change, I can still hear its loudness, if you like, through the timbre. And that, you know, a lot of pop songs, if you listen, uh, well, if you watch the meters while they're going, you'll see that what's supposedly the quiet verse and the loud chorus are actually exactly the same amplitude on the meters. But what you hear is the difference in the timbre of the voice or the guitars or whatever it is. Um, uh, Alanis Morissette's um, Ironic is a, is a good example of that because, the, because it's so compressed as a, as a mix that the levels really do stay more or less rock solid throughout the whole song and you've got that very quiet verse and very loud chorus. So, um, and so what that's doing is using the single feature of timbre to represent a multi-featured property of sound, which is volume, if you like, or uh, increased energy in expended on uh, performance. And, and we, that, just that single parameter of timbre is enough to convince us that we're hearing something getting louder. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, there we go. Um, materiality of the tool or instrument. Um, there's a lo lovely word that uh, um, Dennis Smalley uh, coined called spectromorphology, the idea of the way that frequency changes over time in a sound event. And the materiality of, um, of instruments and, uh, well, instruments in terms of the um, in terms of the musical examples, is often related to the attack transient particularly. That's the primary way that we differentiate between instruments is what happens in the first sort of 50 to 100 milliseconds in a sound. Uh, but also we hear resonances, for example, in the difference between a wooden snare drum and a metal snare drum. The, um, the main thing that we'll hear that difference through is the frequencies that are happening in the resonant tail of that drum rather than the attack transient. So we can hear the materiality of an instrument through that spectromorphology, if you like. And then finally, the idea of spatial characteristics. Um, well, 
reverb time, the frequency content of the reverb, and things like pre-delay all give us clues, and also the things like the interaural differences, the different, uh, the different timings between uh, things arriving at our ears, tell us information about spatial positioning. And again, we can be kind of fooled, if you like, into, uh, into hearing one of those parameters without all of them and hearing something spatial, even though it's, a, if you like, a line drawing of a long reverb rather than the, the real sound of a long reverb. Okay, so, um, so in, a, in a very simplified version. Really you could sort of bring this down to who is doing what to what and in what space or where. Um, and, that's the, uh, and that's the idea of, of how we um, create metaphors from these types of uh, perceptual activity. Okay, so How can we use this in practical terms? Um, well, I better get a move on so I can play both of Andrew's um, videos. Uh, got a bunch of questions here. How, who are the, what are the attributes that will afford the interpretations that you want? How can you manipulate those attributes? And which tools will you use to do this? Uh, so what I'm going to do is to bring Andrew up, our invisible friend, um, and he's going to talk about size and drums in the first instance, about the size of materiality of a drum when he's mixing, about the size and shape of the gesture, and about the size and nature of the space and how that can affect our possession, per, uh, perception of size. Okay, so. Hi everyone, we're just going to uh, explore some of these ideas that Simon's been talking about around size. Um, in this case, around some, some drums here that have been recorded that have had a bit of minor phase alignment treatment just to add focus and to have coherence onto the really when we pop into the space. Um, and now we're going to look at how we might manipulate the size of these drums. So let's have a quick look. Of these drums are nicely recorded, but um, to make kick drum sounds like it was almost too small for the record. So, what we're going to have a look at doing is um, increasing the perceived size of this kick drum um, through manipulating the sense of resonance and trying to pull that sense of resonance a bit lower, uh, which in turn will, will make us believe that it is a slightly bigger kick drum. I do that by boosting around this uh, low 50 hertz here, which is just below the kind of or the centre of that kick drum, which again should give it that feeling of being. A slightly bigger instrument than it is, so let's keep it going. That's an EQ. Just push it down beyond where you would on the record, just so hopefully it translates to some extent when you are all in. Um, and also, I can make the drum sound a lot smaller by getting it right. Which is also a very cool sound in this case, taking a while around down, making it feel like a, a small sort of beat box style kit. We're going to add some, some of that in there. But also, I want more sense of the beat hitting the drum to make it sound like it's been tuned slightly tighter um, on the batter head, and also the player to playing with a slightly bigger gesture, manipulating the size of the drum and also the size of the gesture behind it, with a little boost around the sort of 4.5k. I say that I mean 15 dB. It doesn't sound like a 15 dB boost at the by pushing that in there and really getting a coherent, coherent sense of the beat of the drum that feels that size, but still pretends a sense of modernity in its hips. If you want it to sound tighter and more modern, of course, we can get it.
So again, that really changes that perception of the size of that drone and also the nature of the space and the, and the size of the gesture playing and the feels more punchy when the numbers being hit slightly harder and changes the sort of material characteristics a little bit. Um, in, the, in the course of the next, obviously, it won't sound stunted as it does and so on, perhaps. Um, we could also extend it a bit with a bit of reverb. This reverb is an ambience. We'll look at that a little bit more in the next vocal, uh, vocal video that's coming. That kind of naturally extends the, the gesture of the reverb of the kick drum a little bit. It's like the, uh, the drums make a slightly different room that being played into that room. I really feel a sense of the gesture of the play. Uh, like the play would play if they were playing in the space um, from that rather than the drum simply appearing in the room. Now the snare however is quite small, so we're going to do exactly the same idea in the snare. I've gone again and found that resonance of there, and this becomes almost like a, a tool for manipulating the amount of the, of the sort of wood of the drum that's really coming through. And again, a similar kind of approach with the with the with the gesture of the stick, the detail of the stick hitting it. Uh, a little bit of compression going in there. <laughs> really just to enhance that transient very slightly um, and to bring out the, uh, the sense of, of the gesture of it being here without compromising the size of the instrument. That's how we to listen to this. So I'm going to pull this back now, this, uh, this sort of, uh, low mid frequency, and so we'll hear then uh, both the material of the drum perhaps become slightly more hidden, but also a slight change in the size of the, of the drum itself. So you can really change the picture you're drawing in your mind there of, of these drums and exactly what they're, what they're doing. So there's some quite significant changes there. And I think also interesting to note at this point in terms of Skip through to the, um, he was going to talk about a bit of bass compression that's going on there, which I've uh, kind of run out of time now. So basically, what I just wanted to um, finish up with two things. One is, if anyone wants to see the other video that Andrew made, um, I'm quite happy to show it to you. Um, I um, can do that afterwards. Uh, but um, what this is about, just to tie it up with a bow, is uh, that Andrew and I are looking at ways of teaching mixing that isn't so tool focused. What has tended to happen in production classes, certainly in the 15 years that I've been teaching, is that they are focused on how do you learn how to use a compressor, how do you learn how to use EQ and noise gate and so, so forth. And they're not very musical descriptions. But, um, the thinking in terms of the materiality of the drum, the um, energy of the uh, activity that's going into it, and thinking, well, what, what would it sound like if that person had hit that harder? How can I make that come out in the mix? How can I make that happen in the mix without re-recording everything? Obviously, best of all worlds, we just record the perfect performance in some ways. But we're also going for the unreal as well as realism. So sometimes we want a schematic representation of a gesture rather than the entirety of a part of a gesture. We want just a bit of extra stick rather than the extra body that would come out of the, the drum sound as well. So how do you, um, how do you explore that uh, idea of teaching through uh, thinking about the sounds as um, activities and their invariant properties and the affordances for interpretation. Thank you very much. So, questions for some? I don't want to drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know if there's a chapter I've read in, I think it's in the uh, Bates and Bennett book, that always does the opposite to this, uh, which is about mediation, which is a two way process. But it's about how, I can see how you, when you talk about voice in terms of acoustic response of the voice, but he talks about how um, recording and effects and so on works in terms of activity. So that it's got this great phrase, gestural excess, that we see in a lot of musicians, particularly 
sort of they're not used to that's really the role that the stage is in. Or in their faces, because of the sound that's coming out of the machine rather than because of their bodily activity. Mm. I'm just wondering where the beginning and the end of all of this is, because it is um, clearly a two way process. It sounds as if it influenced gestures, which is... It, it is. I mean, it, I mean, it certainly is very true that the visual affects the oral, that you hear something different. If you hear an exaggerated... If you see an exaggerated gesture, you'll hear the sound differently. Um, and, you know, we do... If, if you can see a cellist within an orchestra, you can hear their part coming out of the orchestra much more clearly than if you and just looking at the ceiling and have your eyes shut. Um, there, I mean, because we're talking about recorded music rather than live performance, that visual element isn't there to kind of disrupt the sonic experience, if you like. Uh, but, I mean, what Andrew does when he's teaching, I've, I've seen these sort of rather comical slides that he puts up of, do we want big drummer with a little drum kit, do we want a little drummer with a big drum kit, you know, and he's got these cartoons that uh, he's found somewhere of different things, and, and, you know, how do we mix it so that it sounds like that? And, um, I mean, it does, it does work as a, yeah. as, a, as a process. I mean, the other thing is more, more in terms of live sound, really. More in terms of when you're watching and listening at the same time. But it's the same. I mean, it's the same process there. That live sound becomes very influenced by the recorded sound, and then musicians end up trying to do the bodily impression of the sounds that are coming out. Of yes. The scenery, rather than the, the, so it's a sort of it's a. It's not really well, that's and that's a really interesting. Um, I, I've got a colleague who was going to do some research on this, but she hasn't. Um, <laughs> so, yes, sorry, she hasn't yet, that's right. But she's a, a vocal teacher and she has complained and worried about the fact that a lot of her students come to her trying to sing as if their voice is compressed. And it gives you very bad technique because all they listen to is vocals that are compressed. And, I mean, you know, they think that's what a voice sounds like, which it is in recorded music, so it does affect the way that um, the performers perform. I, 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 read, I read a chapter called Real and Unreal Performances in um, Anne Nelson's Rhythm in the Age of Visual Reproduction, which is about the way that drum technology and drum performance changed with the advent of recording technology and drum machines. The, as soon as you start getting EQ being used extensively on drums, you start getting drummers playing with nylon tips in order to sound like they've already got EQ on their um, snare drums. You start getting those um, snare heads with pads on them that um, sound like a gated snare drum rather than a... So the, the actual drum manufacturers started changing the technology to sound like recorded drums, and drums started playing much more evenly and consistently to sound more like drum machines and click tracks and so forth. So it, it has affected performance a lot, yes. So that was a very long answer to So just one really quick question and then more discussion over the line. That sounds that good to me. Right? Yeah. So a quick one. Oh. Yeah, quick. This is kind of a follow-up to the previous question. Um, I'm wondering what you, when you have your slide with the categories of different kinds of energy and the spatial characteristics up there. I was wondering if there's a category for, for special effects that we, that we recognize as special effects. Um, I'm thinking of, in one of the other sessions this afternoon, I heard the, someone played a tune by Rihanna. Rihanna is singing and speak doing and stuff, and she's, we, the, her voice is bathed in rebirth, but when she stops singing, there's a, a delay that's put on her that has absolutely time with the drums that will just stop. So you hear it as a her voice echoing the drum, that sort of thing. So it becomes like this musical structural element that you become very aware of as a listener, but you can't equate it to anything representation per se. It's a musical structure. I wonder if there's a yeah. kind of category of effects that well, are. I think it still has a spatial characteristic, or yeah. at least a gestural and spatial characteristic to it. 
and I think we create, I mean, I think There's all of the things, the people, yeah, well, yes, as well, yes. All of the things that we can't put in a, a neat kind of simile style box, we feel in ways, I mean, and I think beat, we do feel in a very similar based uh, connection. But the fact that the voice is doing this in some weird way creates a spatial idea for us, but it, you know, it's like, it's, it's like seeing a Dali picture of a watch folded over a, whatever it is that he folded it over. Um, you, you kind of go, well, that's a watch and it's not a watch. And it's interesting because of its watchness, and then it's also interesting because of its paintingness and the way that he's yeah. playing with that. And so I think that is exactly the same with, with particularly electronic sounds. That that we you know we often understand synth sounds in relate well no we do understand synth sounds in terms of their relationship to other sounds, but also in relation into relationship with their inability to be made by um, acoustic means. Okay. There's like, you made the full map analogy really well, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering if there's a category of effects again that we recognize that we form a different that dissolves. We see a dissolve, and we, we know what it might mean contemporarily in terms of narrative, and narrative, but we recognize it as a film technique as opposed to a representation. First. Yeah, I but it's still a representational. Like yeah, I mean, I suppose it's part of the medium. Yeah, I'm not. I think there is this this whole thing, as I said right at the beginning, between what we recognise as the narrative, if you like, and what we recognise as the medium, yeah. and um, and the effects work some way in between those two things, both you know, dissolves, close ups fast cuts, but um, delays and phasing and all those kinds of things. It's, in a lot of ways, it's partly what they're like and it's partly what they're not like. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.